Look at your place map for a moment. You can see right up front the, the place of power, the mighty name of Jesus. If you, don't, if you don't remember anything else in this whole eight-week series, you must remember that your victory over the enemies of our soul is in the mighty name of Jesus. It's not just something that is, it's something that we have to call on. We have to speak it out. We have to call on the mighty name of Jesus for victory. Now the purpose of the course is set forth in the two verses of Scripture that are in front of you there. And uh, Harvey, you're a good loud reader. Would you read those for us, please? Like Corinthians 2, 10 and 11. If you forgive anyone, I also forgive him. And what I have forgiven, if there is anything to forgive, I have forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sake, in order that Satan might not outwit us. For we are not unaware of his schemes. We are not unaware of his schemes. Can you say that that's true in your life? Yes. You feel like you are un, you are you're you're a fully aware of Satan's schemes. The normal Christian life is one that is fully aware of Satan's schemes. Second scripture. First John four one to three. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming, and even now is already in the world. Alright. So, we are here so that we will not be ignorant of the enemy and his strategies, and so that we will be capable and effective at testing the spirits and making sure that we are not deceived and led into sin. You have another sheet of paper there that is lesson notes. There are blanks on there that you can fill out as we move through the lesson. Then you have what's called rules of engagement. I want to walk through this with you tonight. We, I won't go through it again after tonight. But the first two items on here is to pray. While you're in class, and when you're not in class, when you're other places, pray fervently for protection for yourself, for all of us, for the church. Jesus said we are to pray that God would lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. That is a worthy prayer and is one that all of us need to have in our hearts uh, uh, ongoing. We need to pray for the Holy Spirit to teach us what God wants us to know. And when I say that we will learn what God wants us to know, I'm not just talking about that you're going to get a bunch of information and walk away from here, but that your, your life is going to change as a Christian. You're, you're going to begin to engage in the spirit realm like you never have before. If you absolutely have to miss a session, maybe for death or nuclear war, Nathan will post it on the website so you can make it up, but I want to urge upon you to please give this class priority, top priority for that two-hour slot on Thursday evening, if you would please. Uh, be here uh, uh, Unless you just absolutely cannot. Make it a special point to arrive on time as a courtesy to all. Try to go to the bathroom before you come into class so that we don't have to constantly get up and run, out, run in and out. And I realize that even if we go, for some of us, we still may have to go. And that's fine. Please, no embarrassment. Uh, no stress. Uh, I, I just uh, have observed that oftentimes in Sunday school and in worship, people are coming and going when... If they would just take care of those things before, it would, uh, it would be helpful. Um, silence your phone if you haven't done it. Do it right now. 
either turn it off or set it on vibration. It would be better if you can turn it off. If, if that's not going to be a problem to you, just turn it off. If you've got a babysitter at home, I understand. You may need to leave, the, leave it on vibrate. Um, always bring your book. We, we may or may not turn to something in the book, but if you're reading it before you come to class, and that's uh, next on here, to always read your assignment, assigned portion before you come to class. If you're reading it before you come to class, you're going to have stuff fresh in your mind. And you may want to refer to it. I may refer to it somewhere along the way. But just so we'll have it for reference, bring it, and your Bible. And we will be using our Bibles. Uh, we've got pens if you don't have a pen. You, you, you should be, you, you really will, you will do better at learning if you take notes. Then I did, and then, you know, every evening, just at least try to identify one thing. Now you're going to go home and pray about it and focus on and maybe study more up in the scriptures about it to, to try to incorporate into your life. And then when you come to worship on Sunday morning, please sit at these tables. Now, I know that may feel a little weird to you, but we don't want to tear the tables down and set the chairs up every week. So for the eight weeks that we're doing this class, we're going to leave these tables up. If you'll come sit down here, then other people will, won't, they don't have to worry about it. They can just pick their you know, chair wherever, and uh, you will look like you know, celebrities up here. Okay. All right. Any questions about the rules of engagement? All right. Um, you've got your reading assignment there. Those titles are not the titles of the chapters in the book. Those are the titles of the lesson. Okay. And um, there are, we will follow the book in the lessons to a great extent, but not completely, okay? So be aware of that. Um, <clears throat> in the book of Revelation, as we will see at one point, um, the scripture says that they overcame by the word of their testimony and the blood of the Lamb. The blood of Jesus Christ is a mighty and powerful deterrent to the enemy. So we're going to start out singing a song Nothing but the blood. Nothing but the blood. Nathan, go ahead and get us going on it. The first four lessons are entitled The Normal Christian Life. I'm not sure that we understand the full dimension of what Jesus intended the normal Christian life to be like. But I hope we can gain that understanding before we leave this eight series of lessons. I think I'd like to begin with a personal testimony of what the normal Christian life can be like for all of us. Uh, this is just one example. It would be different for someone else. But Connie, would you come and share uh, that uh, one little testimony that we discussed, please. Um, let me get this microphone for. Can you come over here and just talk into this? Oh my goodness, we need a red box. Many years ago, I think some of you have heard um, how, how I do things a little bit differently than other people. And I found um, I was so frustrated with um, not being successful with the Christian life, being a failure day in and day out. And so one day it came to my mind, which I suppose was the Holy Spirit or the Lord speaking, I guess, you know, that's kind of how it works. And I decided I would walk in the mornings. 
And so I started walking and I found a little park. This was back in Denver, when we lived in Denver. And I found a little park and I would go at 4.30 or 5 in the morning and I'd start walking around. And I'd take my Bible and I read it and I pray and I sing and I do all of those things. And I thought it was a safe place. I mean, you know, five o'clock in the morning in Denver at a park, eh, not such a wise thing. But there was a group of men that were on the other side of the park and I could hear them praying and shouting praises to God. And so I thought, okay, this is an okay place. Well, many, many things have happened since then. But that was one of, one of the first experiences that I've had. So I have my little Bible, and I was in Psalm 139, and I was reading. O Lord, you have searched me, and you know me. You know me when I sit and when I rise. And all of a sudden, out of a ditch over here comes three pit bulls headed straight for me. And I panicked, and I thought, oh my goodness, you know, here I am all alone, all by myself, except for those guys. In fact, that morning they had skipped their morning prayer of all days. Here comes these three pit bulls headed straight for me, and I went, oh, Lord, and I turned around, and behind me, and you can laugh at this, but behind me was a figure dressed in white. And he said, it'll be okay. Go on your way. So I turned, went on, the pit bulls went another way, and I went my way and figured out what was going on. But the Lord is so good. There are angels that we are not even aware of. Yes, there's Satan and there's devils and there's demons, but there is, we live in a spiritual world. And the angels are mighty. Um, they are supernatural. They do protection. But it was so comforting to see this whoever it was. I didn't have a name for him, but whoever it was. And he disappeared. I never saw him again. That was it. So that was the angel of protection when I needed it, visibly. Open our eyes. It's kind of like the other day I was driving, and I drive 21st to work every single day. And, and one of my friends said, oh, did you see that veterinary clinic? It, they had a sign up or something. I said, what veterinary clinic? I've never seen that. But she brought it to my attention, and every time now that I drive on 21st Street, it's like, how could I have not seen that? What is wrong with me? I mean, it's blazing. <laughs> it's huge. It's the same way with our spiritual life. Let's open our eyes, open our hearts to the Lord Jesus Christ and the miracles and the amazing things that happen are indescribable. Thank you, Connie. She made the statement, we live in a spiritual world. And, and I'm not sure that most of us, I know this has been my experience, I'm not sure most of us really are aware that we are in a spiritual world as we go about our daily activities. And that's why I've called this the normal Christian life. And I'm sorry if that print is not big enough to read, hopefully the ones in the future will be a little bigger. Um, the fine print up there basically just says, please be sure you read your reading assignment before you come to class. You'll get more out of the class if you do. The normal Christian life, the normal Christian lives with an awareness of spiritual reality. I don't know how to emphasize this enough. Well, we're all normal Christians, aren't we? You can, anybody here that's an abnormal Christian? <laughs> I mean, is there such a thing? A normal Christian, if, we're, if we really are Christians, a normal Christian is assumed to be, expected to be in Scripture, 
Someone who lives with an awareness of spiritual reality. If that's the case, if I can borrow a phrase from Francis Schaeffer, how then shall we live? If we live with awareness of spiritual reality, if the normal Christian life is a spiritual life, with an awareness of spiritual reality, then what kind of difference should that make in our lives? Well, what's the nature of God? What's, what's, what's God's essential nature? Spirit. spirit. He is a spirit. Okay, somebody tell me, what is a spirit? Do you have a, do you have a definition? Okay, you might be able to see it at times, or you might hear. Okay, but what is a spirit? How would you define it? Pure energy. What? Pure energy. <laughs> Pure energy? Some would call it that. It's unseen. What? It's unseen. It is unseen. The essence it, of something. Yeah. All right, all right. That's that. Yeah, those are all. Those are all part of it. Well, I, let me just put it this way, okay? I, I would. I would define it. I think if I had to define it, I would define it the life force of a personal living being. We are spirit. We are more than spirit. God is more than spirit. But we are, in our essential nature, spiritual beings. We are humans with spirit flesh beings. John 4.24. I need, y'all are going to have to get with me on this. John 4.24. What does it say? Alright, God is a spirit. The Bible just makes the statement. God is a spirit. Alright, well let's go to Genesis 2.7. Um, let's see, uh, Shawnee could read that for us. Genesis 2, 7, and Max is going to look up 1 Corinthians 5, 5. In Genesis 2, 7 it says, Then the Lord God formed the man out of the dust from the ground. He breathed the breath of life into his nostrils, and the man became a living being. All right, when he says he breathed into the nostrils of Adam and Eve, or Adam, uh, when he breathed into his nostrils his breath, that word for breath or breathe is the same word as spirit. Exact same word. can be translated either way. Breath or spirit. God's breathing into Adam and Adam becomes a living being. That life force enters into him and he becomes a personal living being. A personal being. A spirit is not just an ethereal entity. He's more than pure entity. He, the spirit quickens within a person, a personal living being. 1 Corinthians 5.5 5. So Isn't that interesting? The spirit is separate from the flesh. The flesh might be destroyed. The spirit cannot be destroyed. Nothing anybody can do to us can destroy the spirit. Well, let's look at, there's a little, there's a little more we need to know about uh, spirit. Come on, what am I? Here we go. Acts 2.38. Who knows that one by heart? Philip. Of the Holy Spirit. Now that's interesting. We have an adjective with spirit this time. A Holy Spirit. How is that different from 
the human spirit. Yeah, where, where, who do we know that's holy? <laughs> All right, yeah, it's, it's, it's the divine spirit. The life force of God comes to dwell within us. His personal life force comes to dwell within us. Now, I realize we're talking about some things here that, uh, to, to, some, to some extent, go beyond our, our grasp to, to really be able to sort it out. You know, we can't lay it on our table and dissect it. All right, so uh, let's, um, let's see. There's an interesting thing. Did you know, have you ever thought about this? A person can be inhabited by more than one spirit? Did you ever think about that? Well, how about it? You, you're, you're, you are a spiritual being. You have a spirit. God has put a spirit in you. He's also put His Holy Spirit in us. So as Christians, we all have at least two spirits dwelling within us. Two life force, personal beings living within us. There ought to be some interaction, shouldn't there? You would think. But whoa, could there be more? Well, what about the time that Jesus confronted the Gadarene demoniac and said, what is your name? And what did the demoniac say? Legion. Legion. For there are many. Yeah. In fact, what was the herd of pigs? Was what, about 2,000 pigs or something like that? They came out into the pigs, or maybe there was 1,000, I forget the number, but it was a large number. There was a lot of demonic spirits in that, in that one man. So, we can have more than one spirit active in our lives. It's important for us to make sure that we only have two. <laughs> Just two. Ours and the Holy Spirit. Those are the only two we need. Any beyond that, we don't need. Okay? Um, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 11.14 uh, Heath, could you look that one up for us, please? And Ephesians 2, 1 through 5. How about Bob over here? And uh, David's Ephesians 6, 12. Can you catch that? All right. All right. Even the devil masquerades as an angel of light. Angel of light. What is an angel? An angel is a spirit being. It's a created spirit being. Okay. Uh, what's the next one? Ephesians 2, 1 through 5. The made a law who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you were once walking, you were walking according to the curse of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. All right, Bob, thank you. There is a spirit who is at work in those who are disobedient. That's another way of saying sinners. Okay. Go ahead, uh, David. Six. Twelve. Six, twelve. For we are not 
fighting against Russian blood and fight against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Who are these spirits? Come on, folks. Stay with me. Demons. Demons. Evil spirits. All right. Evil spirits. Demon, demonic spirits. Let's look a little bit further. Um, Michelle, could you look up John 16, 11, please? And um, maybe um, Jan, how about Revelation 12, 7 through 9? John sixteen eleven. Okay. Okay. John sixteen eleven. And concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. The ruler of this world has been judged. Important to know that. Revelation twelve, seven through nine. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon and his angels fought back. But they were defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. The great dragon was thrown down. That ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. Okay, thank you. So we learn then that there... There has been a struggle in the spirit realm. And Satan and his demons have been defeated uh, by God and his holy angels. All right. And that defeat was uh, gained, as we learn in the New Testament, through the crucifixion and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, here's... Here's where I, where I want us to go with this. The normal Christian life, the normal Christian lives with an awareness of spiritual reality. Think about it. God is a spirit. You are a spirit being. The Holy Spirit dwells within you. And there is a horde of demonic spirits led by the chief spirit, the prince of this world, Satan. Now, if we walk through this life just conscious of the natural, we're going to miss the most important part of life. If there is this much spiritual reality in our lives, we have to be engaged spiritually. We can't just float through life acting and reacting to the natural circumstances around us. Our enemy is not flesh and blood. The scripture teaches us. So there, there must be interaction between our spirit and the spirit of God. And, and the scripture teaches us, Jesus calls the Holy Spirit his spirit. So we have the spirit of Christ within us. So we have interaction with God the Father. We have interaction with Jesus, who is the Holy Spirit within us. And we have interaction with one another. Did you realize that we can have interaction with each other in the spirit? In the spirit realm? When we come together... And we engage one another in worship 
when we participated in communion here this evening, and our spirits come together in unity, what does the scripture, the Apostle Paul says, the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace in the Christian community? That's what, that's the normal Christian life. <coughs> Fighting and bickering and criticizing and tearing down and, and dividing churches and, and focusing on buildings and programs and all of that stuff is just stuff that serves to distract us and to divide us. But when we come together in the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace, there is an, there is an unbreakable fellowship. But, but that has to be something that we are consciously engaged in. It has to be something that we yield our will to. It's not something that just automatically happens. Because we are more than spirit. God has given us a soul, and in our soul we have a will. We have a mind that works. We have all kinds of attributes that can, get, can all be brought, be brought together to overthrow the enemy and bring the kingdom of Jesus Christ into reality among us, which he said, is within us. He said the kingdom is within us. Questions? I read the first two chapters of this book. I'm just wondering, a, a true Christian, a real Christian, who falls Lord of Jesus in the heart, how can they possibly be possessed by a demon if they have Jesus living in them? Okay. Well, Okay, that's an excellent question. Uh, and I think if you will go back and look more carefully at the book, he will point out that he's not teaching possession. He's not teaching that Christians have, are possessed of the Holy Spirit. The idea of possession, which is commonly spoken of, the, the idea of possession gives you the, the connotation of ownership. No demon can own a Christian. Okay, But, there is another terminology in Scripture that we can use. Uh, when a person is demonized, there can be a stronghold in their life. Now, let's explain it this way. Um, you drive down the street, and here is a, a big two-story house, lots of rooms. And the lights are on in every room except one room. And one room's dark. That can be your life. There can be a place in your life that is that where the strong man, and the scripture calls him the strong man or the, the demon, has gained the right to control in that area of your life. That's one of the things that we're going to study through as we go through this. You might not think it's possible, but it is possible. It's not only possible, it's reality. We've experienced it here. The word oppression can be used, yes. Yeah. We can use the word possession as long as we know what we're talking about. As long as we understand. We're not saying that, the, that a demon owns that person. That it can have... Uh, the total and complete, absolute control over that person, and they have... No, that's not what we're talking about. Uh, when, when, when we talk about... When, he talk, when, when people talk about possession, our author is telling us that he, 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 we can't think of the idea of ownership. We need to think in terms of a stronghold or a foothold, a place, a place, let's say for, for example, a place in a person's life of um, um, uh, anxiety. We'll go with anxiety. Uh, a person is 
obsessively anxious and unable to deliver themselves from it. No matter about all the Bible reading, all the praying, all the church going, having people pray over you, the counseling, and all of the stuff that people go through to get rid of anxiety. But there's still something inside of them that seems to be in control of that part of their life. They have the right to that because there's some unconfessed sin in that person's life that has not been dealt with. They allowed that enemy to come in uh, habitually and continually until it took up squatter's rights in that particular part of their life. The rest of their life may be fully under the control of the Holy Spirit, but that one part has not yet been surrendered. So would we refer to that person as being full of the Holy Spirit? Yes. Even though there's a dark room in there? Yes. Yes. But there is yet an area that needs to be surrendered. Well, okay, let's put it this way. We, we, can all, can, we can all receive more of the Holy Spirit. We all have room for more. Good question. Any others? Do you think that in this life, do we ever get to the point where we don't have any of those areas of stronghold? Where we what? Where we don't have any of those areas of stronghold? Is there, can we get to this place in this life where we don't have any of those areas of stronghold? Yes. There's a difference between a stronghold and temptation. Where there's a stronghold... We are, we, we, in that particular area of our life, we, we're being controlled. I know where Rhonda's question is coming from, because when I read that, the readings for today, it bothered me a lot that some of these people that were, that he referred to, were, were Christ. They belonged to Christ. Yes. Yeah. Awful yeah. Yeah. I, I realize that, and, and you, you'll find this controversial. You'll find people, uh, Bible scholars, uh, that do not want to acknowledge the work of the devil in, in our lives, the spiritual work of the devil in our lives. And they, they will, they'll flat out say, a Christian cannot be demonized. But reality proves that wrong. So if you're demonized, at some level, have you lost your salvation? No, 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 absolutely not. But we have a response, we, but we, we are called upon to be free in Christ. And there's an area of a person's life where they're not free. And they can't set themselves free. Jesus has to set them free. So that part of their lives has to be surrendered to Him. In the mighty name of Jesus, they, they can be set free. I think most Christians are set free. And most, I think most Christians are not demonized in the sense of having a stronghold where there is a, poor, a place in their life that's out of control. Most of us are just simply dealing with common sin and temptation. But there are probably more, more of it than we know. Yes? Um, this is a big controversial point, is the fact that I'm a Christian and I uh, appreciated uh, hearing you teach one time refer to Luke 13, 16. Read it, please. It says, Then should not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, which is an indication that she is a child of God, whom Satan has kept down for 18 long years, be set free on the Sabbath day from what bound her. Did you all hear that? Everybody hear that? Luke 13, 16? Okay. You may want to make a note of that. It would be an example of what we're talking about. Okay, thank you.
Max. So what happens though, if you ask Jesus to set you free, but you haven't received the free? Well, okay, you're going to find, as before we're through with this, you're going to find out why, okay? But ultimately what it comes down to is that particular area of your life has to be set before the Lord, and he has to, you, you, you have to yield that to him, okay? And, and you have to give up the ground that the enemy has taken over. And you do that in a very specific way, so... Uh, that'd be fine. We could we can do that. All right. Thank you. you want me to stay up here? You uh, if you if you'd like to, uh, okay. yeah. Or do, or do you want to just take it to him? What? Or do you want to just? Take no, it? I don't want to take it. Uh, yeah. If you'd okay. like to take it to him, that'd be fine. <laughs> okay. Let's move on. The normal Christian life takes every thought captive. Second Corinthians. 10 5. Uh, yes, Donna. We demolish, we demolish arguments and every pretense and we set itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. We take captive every thought. Do y'all practice that? Did you take your thoughts captive for Christ? <laughs> Thought comes into your mind. I am such a failure. What do you do with that thought? I am so ugly. I am just worthless. How could I... How, how can it, how could I even think that I'm a, a Christian after the things I've done? You get those kind of thoughts? Where, where do those come from? See? Do you take them captive? We take every thought captive. Now, this is the thing of, uh, that is... We're moving, we're moving from the point of saying that we, the normal Christian life is a life with, a, with a, a, a constant awareness of spiritual reality to saying now that the normal Christian life is a life where we take every thought captive. If you're, if you're living with the spiritual awareness, the reality of spirit, and you have spiritual awareness of the reality of the spirit life, then we've got to pay attention to our thoughts. My goodness. We, we, have, we, have, spirits, we have spirits speaking to us all the time. God's trying to talk to us. Jesus is trying to talk to us. Satan is trying to talk to us. In any number of a horde of demons are shooting arrows at us, which are nothing more than thoughts, by the way, for the most part. So how do we take thoughts captive? Well, one of the things that is very critical and very important is the royal command. That is supposed to be Mark 12, 28 through 31. Mark 12, 28 through 31. And I think Charlotte has it right here. <laughs> Mark 12, 28 through 31. I'm be sure I'm on the right one. 28. One of, the leaders, uh, one of the teachers of religious law was standing there listening to the discussion. He realized that Jesus had, Jesus had answered well, so he asked, of all the commandments, which is the most important? Jesus replied, the most important commandment is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the one and only Lord, and you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. Thank you. And your neighbor as yourself. Yeah, that's fine. Um, if we measure our thoughts against the royal commandment, wouldn't that change what we do with our thoughts? Mm -hmm. 
Think about it. I'm really uncomfortable with that person. I don't like that person. What does the royal commandment say? I really, I really don't feel like going to worship and being around Christian people right today. What does the royal commandment say? The royal commandment helps us take our thoughts captive. The scripture not only says that God is the spirit, it also says God is love. So if the spirit of Christ is within us, then we don't have to try to love each other with our ability to love. We love each other with his love. His spirit within us, enabling us to love with God's love. If we try to love each other with our own love, we're going to fall woefully short. But knowing and understanding that God is love and His Spirit dwells within us gives us some tools with which to judge our thoughts so that they can be taken captive. There is another factor that can be very helpful in our thought life. Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 26. Rhonda, if you would read that for us, please. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, your lives will produce these evil results. Sexual immorality, impure thoughts, eagerness for lustful pleasure, idolatry, participation in demonic activities, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, divisions, the feeling that everyone is wrong except those in your own little group, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other kinds of sin. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. But when the Holy Spirit controls our lives, he will produce this kind of fruit in us, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Here there is no conflict with the law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and cru crucified them there. If we are living now by the Holy Spirit, let us follow the Holy Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Let us not become conceited or irritate one another or be jealous of one another. Thank you. Now you see the, the stark contrast between the fruit of the Spirit and, and, and the fruit of the, of the flesh or uh, of the enemy? There's, a, there's a, a very clear difference. Now, uh, there are several sin lists in the Scripture. That we, you know, it doesn't hurt for us to read those lists every once in a while and, and think about them, pray over them evaluate our, ourselves, but we can measure our thoughts against those things that the Scripture tell us, things that are sinful and things that are of the Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit. And, and that, this helps us take our thoughts captive. Is it loving? Is it corresponding to the fruit of the Spirit? Or is it playing to the sins of the flesh? Sinful flesh. Roger, I think that's when, that, when the Holy Spirit kind of makes you show a little bit. I had a co-worker today that was in a horrible mood. And so my response was, <coughs> she's not going to talk to me. I'm not going to talk to her. <laughs> I will sit in my corner and we both can talk all day. And then it's like, is that the way to act? Do you think that's very becoming? And so I thought, oh, probably not. And so I went over and started visiting with her and found that she really wasn't feeling very good physically. 
And so there was nothing. Now I'm not always obedient, don't get me wrong, but that's when to me and the Holy Spirit just it's just like the Holy Spirit will help us evaluate our thoughts if we are if we live with an awareness of the spiritual reality. That's that spiritual world. Yes. Yes. So we have to pay attention to what goes through our minds, folks. We have to pay attention to our thoughts. God has something to say to you. Jesus wants to talk to you. The devil and his demons have a whole lot of stuff they want to say to you. You have to decide which one you're going to listen to. Which which spiritual circle of fellowship will you enter into? You know, Jesus made the point. You cannot sit at the table of demons and the table of the Lord at the same time. Spiritual reality. So, let's look at some more scripture here. Luke chapter 14, verse 18. Roy, can you get that one for us? Luke 14, 18. And um, <clears throat> uh, Sonia, Romans 8, 21. And let's just stay over there with John. How about if you'd look up 2 Corinthians 3, 17. Okay. My and Bible's missing Luke. <laughs> what? My Bible's missing Luke. <laughs> okay. Uh, 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 David will do the Luke. And then Bob, would you get Galatians 5.1? All right. Luke 14.8, uh, uh, David. Okay. 14.18. It's 4.18, right? 14.18. 4. 4. 4.18. What? Yeah, what I said. 4.18. <laughs> okay, all right. Luke 4.18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free. Okay. And Romans 8.21. That the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. All right, thank you. And 2 Corinthians 3.17. John? Uh, yeah. Now the Lord is the sp now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Ah, interesting. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. Okay, and Galatians 5.1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. Okay, these passages of the Scriptures are intended to help us understand that the normal Christian is a person who has been set free. Christians are free. What does that mean? What does it mean when it says we're free? <coughs> we are born again. What, friend? We are born again. We're born again, yes. We are free from the bond of sin and death. Free from the bond of sin and death. Absolutely, okay, that... That's the first and foremost. We are set free from the bond of sin and death. What, is it, what does it mean to be set free from the bond of sin? We don't have to have a stronghold in our life. We don't have to. Have, we don't. Yeah, we we do not have to live with strongholds of sin in our life. We don't have to put up with temptations. Even we can. We can shed those things off. That's not easy. <laughs> Sometimes it takes everything we have and, and the power of God beyond. 
But we do not have to live with bondage. I'm convinced many Christians live with bondage in their lives. They know Jesus. They've been born again. The Holy Spirit has come into their life. They give themselves wholeheartedly to the Word and to prayer and to worship and to fellowship and even to Christian ministry and witness and still hold within their lives areas of bondage. That ought not to be, brothers and sisters. It's not necessary. We can be set free. That's what Jesus came to do. To set us free. Luke 12, 32. Jason, can you get that? And Joe, First John four eighteen. Luke Luke twelve thirty two. So don't be afraid, little flock, for it gives your father great happiness to give you the kingdom. Okay. We we don't have to we don't have to be afraid. We don't have to live in fear. Except for the fear of God, the reverence of God. Joe? There is no fear, there is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. Okay, so when the love of God uh, is, is, is filling us, when God's love is filling us, we have nothing to be afraid of. We don't, we don't have to be afraid of this world. We don't have to be afraid of the devil. We don't have to be afraid of, of God. Now, this is not, it doesn't mean that we wouldn't, say, not want to, to, to be beheaded if we were being persecuted. And... and uh, be fearful of the pain and the, and the experience of trauma of all that. But it means that we would not be fearful so that we would flee from it. It means that we would, we, we would be set free from fear. We, we could stand up under anything this world brings against us. We don't have to be afraid of it. Why don't we have to be afraid of it? We are free in Christ. What does that mean? We have someplace else to go. The Lord <coughs> we'll just get there quicker. You know? Yeah. N nothing can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus, Paul said. Nothing can separate us. Nothing can take us out of the palm of his hand. Normal Christian life is a, fear, is a life of no fear. Well, but, hey, we're running several hundred dollars a week short in our budget. Do we need to be afraid? No, we don't need to be afraid. We need to respect the Lord's money and we need to honor Him as our provider. And we need to place our trust in Him. And he will, he will guide us through whatever we have to go through. But we don't have to be afraid. Would it, would it devastate you to the point that it would shake your faith if we lost this building? What would that do to you? What would it do, what would it do if uh, we had to stop paying salaries? Can God 
Can God take a church through something like that? Yes. And, and, and we can be secure in Him? Of course we can. There might be changes, but change is not bad. But the point, the point I'm trying to make, I'm not, I, don't, I, don't want to, I don't want to take you down a, a rabbit track here. The point is, we don't have to live in fear. We have a God who is able, a God who loves us. And His perfect love casts out our fear. We know He, he loves us. But we're supposed to, if we have the Holy Spirit in us, then we need to be visiting with Him about that. Absolutely. Right on target, Sharon. Yes. If we have the Holy Spirit in us, then we need to be visiting with Him about that. Yes. Exactly. He's the one we have to go to. Absolutely. Yeah. First, uh, Philippians 4.6. Uh, Terry? Philippians 4.6. And 1 Peter 5.7. Uh, Andrea, could you do that? First Peter 5, 7. Okay. Do not be anxious for anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Don't be anxious. All right, everybody that is not anxious about anything, raise your hand. Come on. This is the normal Christian life. Not right at the moment. Not right at the moment. Yeah, not right at the moment. We don't, why don't we have to be anxious? Why, can we not, why is it possible that we can not be anxious? Because God takes, takes care of things. God takes care of things. We can trust Him. We don't have to trust in our own resources. Next one. First okay. Peter 5.7 Cast all your anxieties on Him because He cares for you. Look at that. Cast your anxiety on him. Why? Because he cares for you. Y'all look at me. Look, look up here for a minute. I want, I want your eye contact. God cares for you. Do you know that? Do you know that in your soul? Then what are you worried about? Roger. That verse just before that says, humble, humble yourselves therefore under God's mighty hand that He may lift you up in due time. Sure. Cast all your anxiety on Him because He cares for you. Yeah, if we humble... Right along, I mean. Yeah, absolutely. If we humble ourselves before Him, He'll lift us up. Yeah. There's, there's nothing wrong with being humble. <laughs> nothing wrong with being humbled by God. Let Him lift us up. Cast our anxieties on Him. He cares for us. The normal Christian life is a life that, of no fear and no anxiety. Now, I'm not saying that we won't be tempted. These are two powerful weapons in the arsenal of the enemy. And He will come at you with both barrels blazing. Things will happen in your life and fear and anxiety will start to take over. What do you do when that happens? You can pray. What else? What? You can rebuke Satan. Absolutely. Yes, in the name, in the mighty name of Jesus. Yes. What else? You can go to God's Word and claim the promises. In essence, we engage in the Spirit. Our Father, our Savior, and we reject the unholy spirits. And we have no fear and no anxiety. We, it's cast out. It's cast out. Roger. Yeah. That it seems like, uh, just in my life, that. There's some things that I, I mean, I have no problem. I mean, the anxiety thing, I'm just, I don't know, I'm work it. But, you know, I have things that are in my life that are, that, that are temptations, I guess you'd say. That, and and uh, 
whereas the next person maybe anxiety is number one on their list. I mean, is that something that's just built within us, or is that something that Satan just continually? Well, we we all have certain proclivities to sin. Okay, some of us have a tendency to be more anxious than others. Some of us a tendency to be more fearful than others. Some have a tendency to be more angry than others. And we could go right on down the line uh, talking about proclivities. We all have to deal with areas of proclivity in our lives that are not pleasing to God, that are a part of our sinful fallen flesh, which we'll deal with in plenty of time uh, in a, in, in, as we move through this. Uh, what we don't want to happen is we don't want we don't want to allow the enemy to set up shop in our lives when it you know and and, and begin to crank out that anxiety. But possibly identifying then those weaknesses in our own life is one of the keys to what what okay we 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 told by the apostle Paul we need to put on the armor of God. What, what is our defensive weapon here when it comes to fear and anxiety? The shield of faith. The shield of faith. The normal Christian life is a life that lives with an awareness of spiritual reality. It is also a life that takes every thought captive and that, and that happens by lifting the shield of faith. We cannot live the normal Christian life without a living faith, a dynamic faith. Otherwise, we, we, we will be devoured. We will be consumed by the enemy. He will chew us up and spit us out day after day after day. We will be a constant wreck. And that's the next one, 2 Corinthians 5, 7. Oh, no, uh, 1 Timothy 4, 4, and 1 Peter 5, 7. I've got Christians live by faith next, okay. Let's go with 1 Timothy 4, 4. Uh, and Fran has it over there, uh, Nathan. Uh, okay, 1 Timothy 4, 4, and 1 Peter 5, 7. Uh, you you want to read that? Uh, who wants to read it? Oh, Bob's got it, okay. I'm sorry. For everything God created is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is, <clears throat> if it is received with thanksgiving, because it is consecrated by the word of God and prayer. Okay. Receiving that, the things that, that come into our lives with thanksgiving, because it's consecrated. Okay. And 1 Peter 5, 7. Bob? Move <laughs> over I here. I, I know it's hard. It <laughs> Who's got it? Oh, okay. Cast all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. There. Same one we just had, didn't we? All right. Thankful, thankful, thankful. Um, do you ever practice giving thanks for the hard things in your life? You have sickness come into your life. Do you give thanks for it? You didn't give thanks for um, having knee surgery? No, I give thanks for the good things that happened. What if you couldn't have had knee surgery? Pardon? What if you couldn't have had knee surgery? What if, what if there was no knee surgery? Thank, give thanks for the knee surgery. Yeah. yeah? I thank you for the recovery. For the recovery. <laughs> there you go. Okay. All right. And... And you learn something about suffering when you have infirmity. Yeah. We, we could go on and on on that. Um, and then Christians live by faith. We already talked about that. Um, Christians pray about everything. Luke 2240. Uh, who wants it? Luke 2240. Michelle? And Philippians 4, 6. Megan? Okay. 
Philippians 4, 6? Luke 22, 40. When he arrived at the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. Pray that you not enter into temptation. Where have we heard that before? Hmm? In the Lord's Prayer, lead us not into temptation. I hope you'll be doing that this whole eight weeks. Or, you know, lead us not into Don't let the devil... Don't let the devil distract us here. Lead me in. You, you, next Thursday night, you're going to say, gee whiz, I haven't had time to eat. I, I, I'm tired. I don't want to go to the class. <laughs> don't be tempted. <laughs> okay? Pray. All right. What, what's the next one? 4-6. Philippians 4-6. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by, thanks, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Okay? You see... Um, prayer and thanksgiving work together to cast out fear. I mean, to cast out anxiety. Prayer and thanksgiving work together to cast out anxiety. We're, we're taking our thoughts captive. Anxiety affects us physically, but it begins in our thought process. So we take our thoughts captive with prayer and thanksgiving, with, with, with the love of God, with our faith. All of these things working together. There's one more. Acts 17.11. Joe, you want to get that one? And 1 Timothy 4.13. Mary, can you get that one? 1 Timothy 4.13. Now the Bereans were of more, noble, of more noble character than the Thessalonians, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. Okay, they, they, had, they, they, had, they were confronted with a situation. They were hearing things they'd never heard before. And... There were a lot of people who were saying, these guys are heretics. So they went to the scriptures to check it out. They used the scriptures, that essentially the first five books of the Bible. Well, they, they had the prophets. They had the prophets and the, and the poetic books as well. But the first five books of the Bible was, the, was their main mainstay of scripture. And they went to the scripture to find out what Paul was saying was true. Um, okay, First uh, Timothy four thirteen. Uh huh. Until I arrive, give attention to the public reading of scripture, to exhorting the teacher. Give attention to the public reading of scripture. Okay, and Second Timothy two fifteen. I think Harvey, you probably got that memorized, don't you? Yes. Uh... All right, and over to chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. 2 Timothy 3, 15 and 16, Harvey. 3, 15 and 16. Avoid godless chatter, because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. Okay, more and more what? Ungodly. Okay. So we... We don't, need all the dis we don't need all the discussion, all the debate. I know it's, it's true. It helps us to talk things over with people, but what we need is the Word. We need to go to the Word. So we have a lot of tools here to help us take every thought captive. So let me read the right one this time. Yeah. <laughs> well, that was a good one, too. Okay, the normal Christian life 
It's a life that is lived with an awareness of spiritual reality. Uh, it is a life whereby we take every thought captive. This is the normal Christian life. This is the way we should live moment by moment, day by day. This is what God calls us to. This is what our lives should be like all the time. We are not like people, other people in this world. The Apostle Paul calls us a peculiar people. We're different people. We have a spirit within us that is the Holy Spirit. So, we take every thought captive. We shut out those thoughts that do not come from the Holy Spirit. We discern those thoughts that are not from the Holy Spirit. And we shut those out. We reject those. We resist those. And the devil will flee. Okay. The normal Christian life is a life where the Christian walks in victory. We walk in victory. I, I want to tell you what. I, 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 this is not easy. Uh, there are days that I... I have to go to the Lord and ask Him to tell me once again that, that uh, we have the victory. Because <laughs> I, I don't feel very victorious. Uh, but the truth of, of reality is that we do have the victory. So, let's talk about our victory. 1 Corinthians 15, 56-58. Uh, Roy's got it. All right, First Corinthians 56 to 58. And uh, uh, Annette, you want to read one tonight? You want to read one? Uh, I can. Okay, how about you take First John 5, 3 through 5? Yeah. Right after Roy. The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm, let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. All right. So we, we, we have the assurance. We have the victory. Let's look at 1 John 5, 3 through 5. As soon as Roy gets there. First John 5, 3 through 5. It's meant to be. We do have it. This is love for God to obey his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. For everyone is born of God, overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Wow. That couldn't be any clearer. Couldn't be any clearer. Our victory over the world. And our victory is faith. And the one who has the power of victory by faith is the one who has the Son of God. We, this is the normal Christian life. To walk in victory. Normal Christian life is confident through Christ before God. Second Corinthians three, four through six. Donna. Um, Ephesians three twelve, Andrea. And in Hebrews four sixteen. Um, Megan. Okay. Such confidence as this is ours through Christ before God. Not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competent confidency comes from God. He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, 
but of the spirit, for the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Thank you. And Ephesians 3.12? Ephesians 3.12. In him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. Okay. And Hebrews 4.16. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Okay. What does it mean to be a confident Christian? Dana? We don't run in shame from what? From Jesus. From Jesus. Absolutely true. What did you say, Terry? No fear, no uh, I forgot the other one. Okay. No fear. Okay. All right. Any other thoughts? We stand firm on God's promises and his word. Stand firm on God's promises. Okay. What what being a confident Christian does not mean is it does not mean we're arrogant. It does not mean we're obnoxious. It, it, it doesn't mean that um, we look down on other people. To be a confident Christian means that our confidence is not in ourselves, but in what Jesus has done for us. And God's promises to us. Does that make sense? Do you understand what I'm saying? Well, Philip, when you do something really stupid, <laughs> and you have this thought come into your mind, good grief, Philip, here you are supposed to be a Christian, you're supposed to be equipping disciples. You're supposed to be a man of God. How can you possibly consider yourself to be a, a, a man of God and, and do things like that? What do you do with that? My answer is, it is written. <laughs> ah, and so when you say it is written, what are you doing? You're quoting the Word of God. So where is your confidence? In Him. In Him. You see, if we had to answer the devil for ourselves, we have nothing to say. He can crush us. Because, let's face it, we are filthy sinners. But Jesus has given us victory over all of that. And our confidence is in God. He has given us promises. Christ has made it possible for our sins to be removed from us as far as the east is from the west. And those condemning thoughts do not belong in our head. We have to reject them. A normal Christian life is a life that is lived with an awareness of spiritual reality. Taking every thought captive. Walking in victory. Let's, uh, let's make it, let's make, let's wrap it up here with Matthew 10.1. <clears throat> Joe? Luke 10.19. Uh, Rod, you want to read Luke ten nineteen? <clears throat> uh, Dana, maybe Ephesians six ten through eighteen. And Sharon, do you want to read tonight? I will. Okay, James four seven. Who hasn't read that would like to? You want to read Dana? First Peter five eight and nine. All right, let's go through these. Matthew 10, 1. He called his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out evil spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. 
Uh, have you ever driven out an, an evil spirit? You can, you know. You have authority to do that. Where you tell them to go. Where are we going to tell them to go? Go to hell. Yeah. Luke 10, 19. trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy nothing will harm you okay um, Shawnee is there anything that the Satan can do to harm you no. nothing why You just got a promise. We just read the promise. There isn't anything the enemy can do to us. I mean, he might, yeah, he might get us crucified. He might in, get to work in our lives and cause us to lose our job or something else. But he cannot harm us in eternity because we are spiritual beings. And our eternity is secure. Next one. Ephesians 6, 10 through 18. A final word. Be strong with the Lord, with the Lord's mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies and tricks of the devil. For we are not fighting against people made of flesh and blood but against the evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against those mighty powers of darkness who rule this world, and against wicked spirits in the heavenly realms. Use every piece of God's armor to resist the enemy in the time of evil, so that after the battle you will still be standing firm. Stand your ground, putting on the sturdy belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. For shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news, so that you will be fully prepared. In every battle, you will need faith as your shield to stop the fiery arrows aimed at you by Satan. Put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Pray at all times and on every occasion in the power of the Holy Spirit. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all Christians everywhere. Thank you very much. What an amazing passage of scripture that we, we sure need to be familiar with and, and and making it a part of our thinking. James 4, 7. Submit, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Absolutely. 1 John 5, 8 and 9. And Be alert and sober home. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a growing lion, looking for someone to devour. Very good. The normal Christian life is one that overcomes the devil. We do not have to sin, brothers and sisters. We are free. We have been set free. We do not have to sin. If we find ourselves caught up in some area of sin and we cannot get free, then there may be a bondage there that we need to be delivered from. But the normal Christian life is one of freedom with victory over the devil in every way and every area. Um, I, I've shared bits and pieces of this. I, I, just, I just want to share it again this evening as we, as we bring this to a conclusion. Um, there, are two area, there are two ways that, that we have to apply these things. One of them is as we talked in our thought processes largely in our thought processes. 
That's where we hear the voice of God most of the time. That's where we, we, we hear the, Spirit, the Holy Spirit of Christ communicating to us. It's also in our thought processes that we hear the voice of the enemy, the devil, his demons, uh, tempting us, shooting arrows at us. <clears throat> the more you become aware of, of the spiritual reality that we live in, the more you are consciously aware of the devil and his demons and their activity in the world around you and in your own life, the more you are going to be able to identify them and, and, have, and, and may have encounters with them that are different from what you've experienced thus far. Because the enemy loves to hide. He just as soon we went on about our business and ignored him. Because he, then he, he can deceive us and he can be effective at, at uh, leading us into sin. But once we're on to him, then he begins to come out more and more. And different people have different kinds of experiences, okay? Uh, not, not ev everybody's experience is not the same. But I just want to share with you a little bit about our experience. Um, we began to suspect, shortly after we moved here, that the house we moved into was full of demonic activity and presence. And uh, finally, after a few years of living with that, just walking into the house and just feeling full of depression and deadness and, and uh, just ugliness, decided to, maybe we need to do something about it. And so I had a couple of Christian women that I had confidence in at the time. And, they came over and the four of us went through the house and we did a house cleansing. Now, a house cleansing is simply, it simply means you go through and you throw out every demon that's in there. You just, you throw them out. And you commit your home and your property to the Lord Jesus Christ, to his glory. You can do that. And if you want to know how to do it, just talk to me. I'll, I'll, I'll help you with it. But we did that, and I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but simply to say that we, we were successful in driving out many, many demons out of our home. Uh, I, I think you've heard me say that the, night, the first night that we did that, one of them tried to suffocate me. Uh, I cried out the name of Jesus, and before it crossed my lips, they released and were gone. Sometimes they will retaliate. Sometimes they will test us. And they will, you know, we, we say we're going to be people of faith. We say we're not going to be anxious. We're not going to be fearful. We're not going to be angry or whatever it is. They'll come in and test us to see whether or not we are. And sometimes they're quite bold and quite arrogant in their testing. You know, you heard me tell about, uh, if you were in church that Sunday, you, maybe you heard me tell about not too long ago when... I was in the middle of the night, sound asleep, and began to be aware of someone looking at me. And I woke up, and there was Connie standing over me, looking down at me. And I thought to myself, what in the world is she doing? And about the time I thought that, all of a sudden, it just morphed into a grotesque face, empty, ghoulish face of a demon. And then, phew, it was out of there. We, we live in our home, and we periodically will see demons. Or maybe occasionally, there have been occasions where Connie has seen an, an angel. And we have numerous stories through the years of those kinds of encounters. We have no fear. Does it frighten you to think that a demon might appear to you in your home at night? That some foul, ugly, cruel-looking face would show up? 
Why be afraid? In the name of Jesus, get out of here. This is my house. This, is, this house belongs to Jesus, and, and, and he's given it to me. You have no place here. And they're gone. Now, they may come back and test you. Did you really mean it? Do you really have your shield of faith up or not? But yeah, you just resist the devil and he will flee. That's true with temptation. It's true with power encounters. It's true with <coughs> deliverance from strongholds. It's true in every case without exception. It's true that Jesus has the victory. And that victory has been given to us. He has given us the power to trample on snakes and scorpions. We don't have to be afraid. They cannot hurt us. Unless we let them. The only ground they can have in our lives is what we give them. Now, we went through a lot of scripture references tonight, and I do plan to continue to use a lot of scripture in these lessons because I want you to see that what we're talking about is grounded in the Word of God. It's not something that I made up. It's not something that our author has made up. Um, much of The whole theme of the normal Christian life is not something that he brings out in his book so much. It's in there, but it's not something he talks about in those words. But uh, I, I just... I just became aware of the fact that far too often, I myself, I catch myself just, just walking in the flesh, just living in the natural. And we've, we've, we've got to stop that. Because if that's where we are, then we're vulnerable. And we don't have to be vulnerable. We've been given armor. Our champion has already killed the, 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 the giant. We can walk in freedom. We can walk in victory. Any parting questions before we wrap it up? <coughs> You've been troopers tonight. Thank you so much.